Oh. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. This is Mary Rasenberger, Executive Director of the Authors Guild, and with me is Cheryl Davis, General Counsel of the Authors Guild. Uh, this is the webinar on the CASE Act, the Act for uh, to Create a Small Copyright Claims Tribunal. Uh, we welcome everyone. <clears throat> we are going to give a short uh, description of the CASE Act and the purpose of it. And then we will mostly be uh, allowing people to ask questions. Uh, so please um, prepare your questions if you haven't sent us questions already. At the bottom of the screen, there is a questions Q&A button. You just click on that, type your question in, and we will be reading along the questions and we'll answer them as, as they come in, in the order they come in. Um, and we will sometimes group questions together, or if it's not in any way relevant to the CASE Act, we may uh, postpone it for another webinar. We are doing a whole series of webinars this fall, and you should have received uh, an email with a list of all of those. Um, so we will start now with Cheryl presenting um, some background information on the CASE Act. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, as Mary already said. Uh, the CASE Act would establish a small claims copyright tribunal within the Copyright Office. And this is important because very few creators, authors, etc., can afford to bring a copyright infringement claim in a federal court, which is necessary because copyright is a matter of federal law. Right now, the expenses of such claims are around at least around $400,000. Uh, and your, the value of the claims that are made are often fractions of that. So as one of our, as from the representative from the Songwriters Guild often says when we're in Congress lobbying for this, uh, if somebody takes my lawnmower, I can bring an action in small claims court. What can I do if somebody takes my writing? And here the, claim, the case act would create an opportunity, a forum for people to take action against people who take their writing. Uh, it would, would the damages would amount to a maximum of $15,000 per claim of copyright infringement, or $30,000 uh, per total case. For example, if you have two claims, if you have one, two pieces of your work taken by somebody, you can bring a claim of up to $15,000 per piece of work, $30,000 maximum. Um, you can make a claim in this, uh, in this tribunal for copyright infringement, for a declaration of non-infringement, essentially if you are wrongfully accused of infringing upon somebody else's work, or you can bring a claim that your work was wrongfully taken down from a website because of a misrepresentation that your work was infringing. These proceedings would be conducted in writing or through telephone or internet conferencing. In other words, you don't have to go any place in order to take part in these small claims proceedings. You wouldn't have to go to DC. You wouldn't even have to go to your nearest federal court. You can do this from the comfort of your desk, nor do you need to hire an attorney. Although, if you want to, you certainly can. Uh, like a small claims court, you can represent yourself. Or another opportunity here is you may be able to get a law student to help you out with this. Uh, the tribunal would consist of what they call three copyright claims officers. These are people who are experienced in the area of copyright law in a number of federal courts. There are the judges there may not be that experience in copyright law specifically. So this would actually be presenting your arguments before somebody who has expertise in your area. It's a voluntary proceeding. So if, your if the defendant does not wish to uh, have their case heard before the Copyright Claims Tribunal, they can opt out of that, uh, which is a big, which is an important factor to bear in mind that it's a voluntary proceeding. And as Mary said, uh, it is going before the House and Senate floor. This is expected to go this fall. Right now, the, both the versions of the bill, the House bill and the Senate bill, have passed through the, their judiciary committees without opposition, which is a great development. So right now, as you may be aware, we've been reaching out to people to make grassroots uh, efforts, grassroots efforts to reach out to your local Senate and represent senators and representatives to tell them that you support this bill because this is the time when they're listening to their constituents and they want to know how to vote. We want you to tell them to vote for this bill. So thank you, Cheryl, very much. 
<clears throat> Do you have anything else to add? I think you, uh, yeah, you covered the, the, the basics, basics of the bell. Of, of the bell. Yeah. Um, we can open up for questions. I do want to just respond to the first question that came in, whether this will be available for Guild members to rewatch, and it will be, it will be recorded and available on our website as are all of our webinars. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to add uh, to what Cheryl said that you can, uh, the, the uh, you can get a lawyer to represent you, though one of the really important mm -hmm. parts of mm -hmm. this act is that you don't have to hire a lawyer. Um, as uh, Cheryl and I are both lawyers, um, and we can both attest to the fact that lawyers uh, and private practice are really expensive. And it is almost impossible, even at the most cut rates, to bring a litigation for less than several hundred thousand dollars. I used to practice in, um, I used to litigate um, in my prior life on behalf of creators, authors, and estates, and other creators. And I cannot tell you how often, you know, we got to a point where we sent cease and desist letters, uh, followed up, you get no response, um, and or they argue with you, they refuse to take down the infringing work or to stop doing whatever the infringement is. <clears throat> and you get to a point where it's like your only option is to sue because that is the only recourse that you have under the copyright rate law right now is to bring a federal litigation. Um, uh, <laughs> I've never uh, represented a creator who was willing to say, yes, um, let's go ahead and spend half a, half a million dollars to protect this claim. And as Cheryl pointed out, often the claims are not worth that much. They're, if, um, uh, by saying how much a claim is worth, what that means is how much that you could recover from a court and damages. So if, um, because e even in a, in a federal litigation, maximum statutory damages are 100, and this is for willful, that is purposeful, knowing copyright infringement, are $150,000 per work infringed. So it is, uh, it's hard to get up to in damages, the, um, the amount that you would need to even justify spending three or $400,000 on a litigation or more. And I will say the complicated litigations often go up to a million dollars. So um, as we've, and we, we've been talking about the author's guilt has been uh, advocating for this kind of tribunal for over a decade. Um, I think Paul Aiken, my predecessor, first spoke about it in a hearing in 2006. Um, it is not just authors, writers who have a need of this, but all, all creators and also small businesses who are copyright owners. Um, the bill, as Cheryl said, the, the, the Tribunal will be optional, and the reason for that is that um, we ran up against constitutional issues, and in um, that uh, everyone has a right to a jury trial under the Constitution to be heard in an Article Three court. Um, so we, um, to get around those issues, we made this tribunal optional for claimants and defendants. Um, so anyone can opt out. That said, we do believe that defendants will want to be in this tribunal as well. Why? Because it's a heck of a lot less expensive. They also have to pay legal fees in a federal court and uh, are not gonna wanna have to, have to spend half a million dollars either. In federal court, there is an option for recovery of attorney's fees. Um, by the prevailing party. However, that is completely up to the judge's discretion. So you never know if you're going to be able to recover those attorney's fees. Often you do not get the full attorney's fees recovered because the judge does not find them to be um, customary or justifiable, um, which I have to say a lot, a lot of attorney's fees <laughs> can be questioned on that basis. Um, but, um, uh, the the uh, for defendants they do have the risk in federal court of being uh, socked with those additional fees so they also have an incentive to be in um, in the small claims court I wanted to add to that 
the UK has a sort has their own version of the small claims copyright court and they found that what happens a lot is that once a claim is brought people are willing to come to the table they're willing to, they're willing to start discussing what a reasonable license fee is so they have found this program to be extremely successful over there yeah so yeah, yeah that's that's a good point <clears throat> um, and for um, uh, law, there are some plans for law schools to have clinical programs where they will, will train law students to assist creators in uh, bringing actions in, in this tribunal. Um, so that's how you would use a, would use a law student. Um, so I guess we'll should we turn to questions. I think so. Okay. okay, so there are questions coming in, and we had some in, in advance that um, we'll get to also. So the, the first question I see is, does the CASE Act protect authors, originators against theft from plagiarizers using print on demand and other new media to plagiarize an author's original copyright registered writings? Um, absolutely. <coughs> um, so, because that is infringement. Plagiarism is infringement uh, provided you're taking um, enough, the, the plagiarizer is taking enough from your work uh, that it is um, uh, more than, more than fair, fair use. use. Yeah. yeah, that mm -hmm. it's, you know, if somebody just takes a paragraph and then changes it up a little bit, mm -hmm. that's not likely to be infringement. But to, when plagiarism rises to the level of copyright infringement, mm -hmm. absolutely, this, that's exactly the kind of case that could, this court tribunal will be useful for. Mm -hmm. um, another example is something I just found out about a couple days ago. Their, um, a, a cover art for a book yes. was um, uh, created by a, a book cover artist. Um, it was a, a book that won awards. And uh, there is a, a photographer, a professional photographer, realized that the book art had been uh, based on her photograph, actually a, a, a cell photo that was on social media, a, a, a selfie. And, um, and she lined up her photograph against the drawing and sure enough, I mean, it's very clear if you look at them side by side that the artwork was uh, based, it took her photograph and then um, either traced it or somehow uh, created used it without the her consent. Yeah, without her consent. And um, when, you know, first interviewed about it, she said, well, you know, what are you going to do? People asked, what are you going to do? And she said, well, I don't really know what to do. Uh, and she did eventually talk to the publisher and they settled. Um, but the, um, that's the kind of thing where if the publisher hadn't been willing to sell, I don't know what they settled for, she could have brought that in a small oh, claims okay. court. Mm -hmm and sued for what she would think would be a reasonable license fee for the use of her photograph. And photographers, uh, this is a big, this, uh, this small claims uh, tribunal will be a big advantage for photographers as we found out because their work gets constantly infringed on the internet. So again, it's, a, it's authors, other small creators, small businesses, as Mary pointed out. These are all people who can benefit from the cost effectiveness and efficiency of the small claims copyright tribunal. So I'm going to move to the, the next question. Um, this is a very good one, uh, raising some of the uh, objections, opposition that we've seen to the CASE Act, which I do want to make sure we yes. talk about because we're really hoping to get as many members and other authors on board to help support the bill. Um, I should just note where we are in, in um, terms of lobbying right now. We are very uh, much in the midst of a grassroots effort to get as much support as we can from creators out there and others, right to your members of Congress, to your senators. We are, if you're a, a, a member of the Guild, you will be or have gotten an email already uh, telling you or asking you to get in touch with your representatives to tell them how important it is. and. Therefore, it is important to you, for you to know what the objections are um, and what, uh, <laughs> what our responses are to those objections. Many of the objections, I will say, are based on prior versions of the bill 
This is the third time this bill has been in front of Congress. Um, it's been already five years in the making. And um, the last year we had objections from mostly internet companies. The Internet Alliance represents Google and other internet companies. Um, and we address those. So let me take the first one, which is a, a, an issue that is raised. So I'm in support of the plan, but those who oppose the act claim that it will be easy to abuse. Similar to what we see with patent trolls, will this be something that those who don't hold legitimate claim to copyright use to strip legitimate rights from authors or clog up the legal system? What safeguards will the acts include to prevent abuse or intentional bottlenecking of the system? Um, so th these are very good mm -hmm. questions. Um, you know, how do you keep the bad players uh, from launching hundreds or thousands of claims? Uh, that was one of the issues that the internet companies and others raised last year. And there are several protections in this bill to prevent that. <clears throat> so, First of all, um, there are penalties for abusing the system. Um, well, the first thing is the Copyright Office Tribunal does not have to take every single claim. They will review the claims and determine whether or not the claim is appropriate for that tribunal. Um, so first you have to pass that bar. Um, the second uh, bar is that if you do bring abusive claims, um, you can be fined. Um, if you bring too many claims that seem to be uh, invalid or not really justified, mm -hmm. you can actually be suspended from using the tribunal. Uh, third, the Copyright Office has, uh, by regulation, will set a limit on the number of claims that any individual or entity can bring in a given year. So that will prevent anybody from overusing or abusing the system. At the same time, we actually believe very strongly that this tribunal will prevent trolling. So in copyright, in the, in the patent world, trolls um, are companies that buy up patents from, um, that aren't really being used by companies and they, they buy up the patents simply to sue others who may be using some kind of technology that involves the patent. Uh, you don't have that in copyright because one, you cannot bring, uh, only the copyright owner can bring a claim. You cannot transfer the right to sue without transferring the rights itself. So you can't have the same kind of corporate patent troll. The second thing is that well, what you do see in the copyright world, I should say, is you have uh, lawyers who will bring uh, a lot of claims on behalf of creators, mainly photographers. I think that's, we've seen it for some jur journalism, but it's mainly photographs where the photographers, just as Cheryl said, have no way really to control the use of their images on online and um, because it's unaffordable to bring single claims for each time your work is infringed we, we have these lawyers who, who just they do it on mass as a way to um, basically make it affordable mm -hmm. and they ask for m m far more than the fee would be to use the photo so if if i infringe a photograph by putting it on my website or uh, I put it in a book, the uh, claimant has the ability, the, the, the copyright owner, to ask for statutory damages. So in the claim letter, instead of asking me for a thousand, which might be equivalent to the fee, it, yeah. right, they might mm -hmm. ask for 25,000 or something um, to settle the lawsuit uh, and not go to court. And, and why? Because you have to cover the lawyer's fees. Um, so the small claims tribunal will be a way to avoid all of that. Uh, instead of having to have lawyers bring these claims and pay their fees, we can take the lawyers out of the equation. Um, do you have anything to add, Cheryl, to that? Uh, well, that I guess I just to 
agree that it is a way of enabling the individual copyright holder to bring these actions. And again, it's in the def it helps the defendant because it caps their damages. It also makes them, uh, it, it caps their, the amount of damages, it caps their legal fees, it makes make their legal fees non-existent. And often, sometimes, if you can just try to get people involved and get them to realize that this is something serious, they're gonna get a notice from the copyright office. It's not just gonna be a cease and desist letter from an attorney. It's gonna be official notice from the Copyright Office that may make some people just start to take this matter much more seriously and make them more willing to say, okay, how much is it that you want? What sort of license do you want to just make this go away? So, um, okay, yeah, so that's a really important point actually, is that the other objection that we're seeing to mm -hmm. this is the idea, oh, you know, the people won't know that they yeah. had a claim filed. And mm -hmm. believe me, when you get served mm -hmm. but with process, which yeah. you have to do under this, mm -hmm. you know, and when you get letters from the Copyright Office, two of them explaining okay. how to opt yeah. out, you'll mm -hmm. know. Um, so I am gonna move to the next question. If a jury trial is the issue, mm -hmm. can the jury be two or three people? Is there a possibility that this will be added later? So, um, a jury trial has to be in an Article Three court. Um, the, the tribunal will actually have three judges. Um, it will be considered an administrative court, um, but that is still not considered a, a, a trial by, by jury. The only way to get around the constitutional issues would be to make this small claims court a, um, a, 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 an actual court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Title III court. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that is, has just been deemed as way too complicated mm -hmm. getting that kind of legislation passed. So, uh, you know, the, 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 I will say the act is not perfect. Um, we've already had to make a lot of concessions, including one of the things I had really wanted was to have a higher cap on damages per work infringed, because now it's only 15,000. And for book authors, your damages for a book can be higher than that. I would say to the extent it's journalism, 15,000, you know, should be fine. But um, we, it's really important just to get this act passed, get the tribunal established, and then we can work out details later. We'll, we'll have some experience. We can see what works, what doesn't work. Um, and potentially even someday having an, an Article Three. Um, court come out of this. Um, but I think once it's up and we yeah. see, I, I, I am very convinced that this is going to be a really good thing. It's going to make creators realize, hey, we actually have mm -hmm. rights. <laughs> yes, we have. A, before, we the people have often felt that the copyright is a right without a remedy. And I was when I was in private practice as well. I the same sort of thing where I would tell people you have a copyright, there's an infringement going on, and they would kind of shrug and say, I can't afford to protect my copyright. I'm just going to have to like bite the bullet and just let this guy do what he's doing with my work. And now if with the case act, you wouldn't have to do that. You'd be able to protect your work. This would give you a remedy for your copyright, a real valid, practical and economic remedy. Yes. Now, a couple of you have asked, well, if people can just opt out, how useful will this be? And that is a really good question. Mm -hmm. It will not be useful in all cases. Um, for instance, um, somebody asked about copy paste Chris mm -hmm. um, situation where someone in Brazil has been taking excerpting, um, cutting and pasting from yes. existing well, romance yeah. titles mainly um, and using them in, in her books. Um, and somebody like that where they're known and we know how to find them, which Nora Roberts, as many of you may know, has actually sued her um, in Brazil. You can sue a foreign party in this tribunal. Um, however, it may be harder to get them to respond. Um, and the reason why this is important is that the, the actual pirates out there, so there are a lot of piracy sites as we have spoken about before, and if you get our newsletters, you know we're trying to do a, a lot to, we're doing a lot of work to try to shut some of those piracy websites down. Most of them, if not all of them, are based uh, 
oversees at least in either the, the people running it, the servers, or there's some aspect of it that's overseas. Um, those people are harder to get into federal court in this country, yeah. and they will be harder to get into, into the, the small claims court, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, that's imperfect. Um, if but if they don't respond at all, they do have to respond. Um, they can't just not respond. And if they don't yeah. respond, there will you be a, a default a default judgment. Now, then there's a question of how do you enforce a default judgment against somebody who's not in the country? Um, and I have in the past, you know, <laughs> dealt with that in, mm -hmm. in federal litigation, even in federal litigation, it's very hard to actually enforce a judgment against somebody who's abroad and just doesn't, you know, doesn't, can't be bothered. And particularly if they're hidden behind um, a URL and it's hard to even know who the actual people are running it. So that is an issue. Um, as I said, we just, we want to get this up and running and see how it, and we won't really know until it's running, whether this is going to be useful or how useful it might be against some of those pirates. Um, and we will continue to be obviously following yeah. it and, and yeah. working on that and, um, uh, you know, trying to, to and trying to enforce those judgments. Mm -hmm. And trying to improve the system where we can, as Mary was saying, this is it's a start. It is a good and valid start, and we will see how things go and what changes may need to be made to improve the system. We have a question: How much support does the case mm -hmm. current case I currently mm -hmm. have in Senate in the Congress? So we have a lot of yes. support. It's really mm -hmm. great. We have almost a hundred. Congressmen and women who've actually signed on to co-sponsor, yes. who aren't just supporting them, but have said, I want to be a co-sponsor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's terrific. Um, you know, we have almost a quarter of Congress yeah. already is on board mm -hmm. and, and others who've said they will support it. Um, and this, this is a, a gradual process. I mean, it's There's, rare to have that many people sign on to a bill as a sponsor. Yeah, and it's got great bipartisan yes. support in Congress, which makes it much more likely that it makes it people take it seriously. I think that that is they're more likely. It's more likely that it's going to proceed further. So, right. Yeah. Well, we go and lobby about this to members of Congress. Mm -hmm. We talk about it as an access to justice issue because it really it is. I mean, here you have entire classes of creators, many of whom do not make very much money mm -hmm. compared to, you know, the median incomes in, in the U.S. And, um, and wh whose careers are based on this right, copyright. That's, that is what, as a creator, as a writer, you have a value. That's, that's what you can monetize, mm -hmm. is your copyrights. And to have a right that is not enforceable in any practical, meaningful way is an access to justice issue. Um, and that is something that members of Congress from both parties mm -hmm. really empathize with. We've gotten very good yeah. um, support mm -hmm. and it, they love having bipartisan legislation yes. to work on mm -hmm. uh, because there's so much going on in Congress mm -hmm. right now that, um, the Republicans and Democrats do not agree on. So it's, they, they welcome this. Yes, you've got people seeing eye to eye for a change on something. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have just as many re Republican oh, yeah. as de Democratic mm -hmm. supporters for yeah. the act. And I should say that's true in copyright generally. Mm -hmm. it, it, we, cross, uh, we cross the aisle on, on issues. Okay, is there a statute of limitations on mm -hmm. filing a case Act claim. My material was plagiarized beginning in 2015, so by the time the case act gets passed, a number of years will have passed. The plagiarizer is still continuing to sell my material, but it began in 2015. So the statute of limitations for the small claims tribunal will be the same as it is um, in federal court, which is three years. Um, from the infringement. Now, the thing about copyright, though, is that if the infringement continues, it's it's it it doesn't matter when the infringement started. Um, at least for bringing the claim, you can still you have three years from the date the infringement stopped to bring a, a lawsuit. 
Now, you will only get damages, though, yes. for the infringement that occurred within that three-year three period, that three-year window. So you will, as long as the, the plagiarizing is continuing, yeah, you can definitely bring a claim there. Just bear in mind that you'll only get uh, three years of, of damages. Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. Yeah. There have been a number of questions uh, about registration or references to registration. Mm -hmm. One thing I do want to make clear is that to, to have a copyright, you do not need to register your work. You still have rights, but to bring an infringement claim, you do need to register your work. And that will be true in the small yeah. claims um, uh, court too. Now there are provisions for expedited registration. So if you didn't previously register your work and you, uh, you wanna bring a small claims action, you can get expedited registration to do that. Um, there was discussion of a provision that would let you bring, um, bring a claim pending registration. And yeah. there were some objections to that. Do you remember how, how what the bill says on that now? Or well, the current version of the House bill does have, the current version of the House bill does have allow you to bring the claim uh, provided that the application has been made. However, it stays the ability of the copyright claims tribunal to make a judgment until it's been decided whether or not you receive the copyright. So the action can be effectively stayed, but you still have to have filed your application before you bring this action. Again, that's the current version of the House bill, so we'll see what happens as things progress and if things change as needed to get the bill to actually pass. Right, and that that is one of the provisions that I know some people have, have objections took to issue it. with because there's a recent Supreme Court mm -hmm. case, uh, the um, Fourth Estate case, thanks, <laughs> that, um, that actually says that you, to bring a an action in federal court, you must have a copyright registration in hand, not just an application file, because the different circuits in the country um, had different opinions about that. Um, but that's based on the court's reading of the legislation. This will be new legislation that will say in this, notwithstanding what you need to do in federal court, mm -hmm. in the small claims court, we will an application yes. is, is sufficient. Now, just to back up though, why would you register? We do definitely recommend registering your work right away within three months of publication. And the reason for that is that if you do so, then you are guaranteed the ability to get statutory damages and attorney's fees. And there will be a, a type of statutory damages uh, and attorney's fees in the small claims court too, though they're capped, as we said, at 15,000 for damages and 5,000 for attorney's fees. Um, so we, we always recommend register your work. It's $35 now if you do it online. The Authors Guild, if you're a member, we will walk you through it. We can help you do it. It's a very easy thing to do. If you are published with a traditional publisher, your publisher should be doing that. Make sure they do. Most publishing agreements provide or should provide that the publisher will do that. They often will not commit to doing it within three months of publication. If you're reviewing a contract about 10 turn to one, put in those words within three months of publication because otherwise, um, you can still get statutory damages and attorney's fees as long as you register before the infringement commences, mm -hmm. but um, you can't do it after the infringement commences and get your statutory damages. So it's such an easy thing to do registration, mm -hmm. just make, make yeah. sure it's done within yeah. the three months, mm -hmm. yeah. And if you have an agreement with the publisher as, you, as a member, remember, send it on to us to make, so we can look at it and make sure that it's got the necessary language in it. And if it doesn't, we can suggest, we can give you language to add it. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I should mention, um, there's a cue to mention that we have a new model contract yes. mm -hmm. that we will be releasing mm -hmm. uh, very shortly. And one, it, the, one of the provisions in that model contract does very clearly say publisher has to register within three months. Should we move on to more yeah, questions? I think so. We've got some more questions. Okay. Um, okay, we just had a question. How does the registration date affect the action? 
seeing the infringement happen before that date. I think we just answered that. We answered that, yes. Yeah, so um, before you bring any action, you have to have, uh, in, in, for you a federal claim, you have to have registered the copyright. Uh, before you bring a claim in the CASE Act, you, you said, as we said, in the current status of the House bill, you'd have to at least apply for the registration. So in either case, you would need to have uh, the copy, you would need to have submitted an application for registration before you can bring your lawsuit. And for saying, if, the, if you're asking, would, how would it affect damages? Well, uh, if, it, if the infringement happened before that date, if the infringement happened before you registered it, as Mary said, that uh, you, can, you can still get some measure of damages for what happens afterwards. But again, you're, for the infringement beforehand, I think it'd be limited to, like, to your actual damages and you wouldn't really get as much in statutory damages, et cetera. So, right. yeah. so that's why we recommend having the registration before as early as possible, because then it makes you much more likely to be able to collect uh, your statutory damages and your legal fees. So I'm, I'm going to read the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, a, less ex a less expensive, faster process mm -hmm. is obviously desirable. However, I'm very worried that this is going to undercut copyright as a whole. The small damages are far too low and scale of the problem is huge. Agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Three judges in DC aren't going to be able to handle more than a small handful of cases, but the damage they're going to do with few teeth in the current system would be significant. So let me let me just clarify one thing: that this tribunal will not replace no. federal court litigation no. by mm -hmm. any means. Federal court litigation is still available to uh, plaintiffs, um, and of course, if the defendant, that is the infringer, uh, opts out of small claims, that's going to be your only resort. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it being that, that this is going to undercut copyright. Yeah. The damages are low. Um, the scale of the problem is huge. Mm -hmm. I am not sure, as I said before, that, that the small claims court is really going to help that much with criminal level piracy. Um, because they're criminals, they're not mm -hmm. going to want to be in small claims court, my guess. Um, and we do have major, major problems mm -hmm. now with criminal level ebook piracy and counterfeiting. And we have written a lot about that um, as well. We just filed comments with the Department of Commerce on counterfeiting, that is physical book piracy. Um, we have filed extensive comments with the Copyright Office on ebook piracy. Um, are, um, and I should, we, the Authors Guild, you know, we, we tend to attack these issues from all sides. There's no one <laughs> magic bullet solution to any of our issues. So what we're doing on piracy is um, we're asking for two things, and we are actively in D.C. right now lobbying on these things and will be all year. One is asking for more funding for the uh, Department of Justice and the FBI to enforce uh, against criminal level piracy. They take very few cases right now. They are strapped for resources. They, they literally just don't, don't have the resources mm -hmm. to handle that many. Um, we, we have been talking to them about some yeah. ebook piracy. Mm -hmm. And they've been very receptive and they've been glad to hear from us. Yes. And they want to know when we bring, when we bring things to their attention. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, and they would like to do more. And my feeling is, you know, when, when your house is robbed, what's the first, you know, place you call? The police. When your purse is stolen, when you're mugged, you call the police. Um, and they usually do something. Uh, when your book is stolen, you should be able to call the police. Now, because copyright's federal law and not state law, you have to call well, the, the federal, federal police. police. Right, which is, which is the FBI. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the Department of Justice is the department that actually, with, with the state AGs, uh, is, is the one who actually will prosecute these cases. So they work, the Justice Department works closely with state AGs to bring these cases. Yeah. Um, so that is one thing. We want to see more criminal level mm -hmm. uh, enforcement of this, of mm -hmm. crimes, right? It's, and, um, and a lot of members of Congress really support us on that. Um, in fact, they're shocked. They're like, but this is criminal. Why, 
you know, why, why do you need the case act? It's comms. We're like, well, because, because the, the FBI yeah. needs, needs help. They need yeah. more funding. Right. Are able to be able to bring these cases? Yeah. And they need funding, I should yes. say, specifically for, for mm -hmm. copyright yes. piracy, because otherwise they're, they're underfunded in other areas too. I listened to a, a, a hearing yesterday where they were, um, uh, uh, on the stand was the um, yeah. head of antitrust for the Department of Justice and um, and also FTC commissioner, and they were being you know quizzed on you know why there wasn't enough antitrust enforcement, and same thing there, there's not enough resources, mm -hmm. so we would need to make sure that there is a budget line item appropriated yeah. just for copyright, copyright criminal. Yeah. Now the other thing, so that's one aspect. The other thing um, to attack piracy is that, um, and I don't want to get too deeply into this, but if you're interested, you know, we can have a separate webinar on this um, as we get more actively into our lobbying, is revising the law that gives uh, internet service providers a safe harbor from infringement that occurs on their sites. Uh, because the way that law has been interpreted, it's section 512 of the Copyright Act. It's often referred to shorthand as the DMCA because it was enacted as part of the DMCA, which is, stands for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, so if you hear that and hear about DMCA takedown notices, that's section 512 of the Copyright Act. And what the courts have done to that statute is really kind of awful, um, and it's happened through a progression of cases. We want Congress to undo it. The, the statute has a number of requirements for, safe, for internet providers to take advantage of the safe harbors. One is that you can't know about piracy, the piracy on your site, the infringement, and if you do, you gotta take it down immediately. You can't have uh, a general awareness of the infringement on your site. You can't benefit from the infringement if you have the ability to control it. And then it also says, and if you receive a takedown notice, you have to take it down expeditiously. So in, for each of the first three requirements, the court has actually said, you need to have specific knowledge, and this is true even for the general awareness requirement, mm -hmm. you need to have specific knowledge of a specific mm -hmm. item of infringing content, you need to know it's infringing, you need to know the location, meaning you need to know the URL. The only way that internet service providers ever get all of that information is if they get a takedown notice that complies with, um, with what's in the DMCA, which means you have to provide the location of the infringing material. You have to identify what the work is that was infringed. Um, you have to swear that it's infringing mm -hmm. to the best of your knowledge. Um, and so be, <laughs> in any event, so now it's, it's turned the safe harbor into a notice and takedown statute. And those of you who deal with piracy and takedowns know how futile that is because you just keep sending notice after notice and Either the same user puts it back up somewhere else or somebody else puts it back up. It's just impossible to control piracy with notice and takedown. And we want to hold the internet service providers who are actually profiting from piracy because they get the eyeballs. And when the more eyeballs they get, the more advertising dollars they get. Um, they're making money from infringement mm -hmm. um, in one way or another. And um, we want to hold them accountable and put some teeth back into Section 512. Um, and one of our um, proposals on the table is a notice and stay down, for instance, um, where if you provide a notice to a service provider that there's an infringement on the site, they not only take that item down, but they take down any subsequent items. You know, they have argued that the internet platforms, and, and Google is the one who most voraciously objects to any kind of responsibility um, on its part. It will, you know, says, well, how do we know it's infringing? You know, they'll even say, mm -hmm. oh, it's gonna break the internet if we have to take things down. Um, the, you know, it's too expensive to do this. Well, you know, B BS, I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry, because they do it already mm -hmm. for YouTube. Mm -hmm. 
they do have uh, filtering. Um, Amazon does uh, manage to keep 99.99, maybe more percent, well, more actually, I'd say. They keep almost all pirated ebooks off their site through, through these kind of mm -hmm. fingerprinting technologies. They are out there and they are available. Let me stop there. <laughs> I'm talking too much. That was a long no. answer to no. the question. Do you have anything to add, Cheryl? Well, I was just going to say that the Copyright Office itself is looking at ways in which to uh, amend 512. They've been uh, doing undergoing hearings and roundtables to get feedback from stakeholders uh, and other groups, including the internet companies, to say, like, what, how is the system working and how can we fix it? And that's what Mary was talking about in terms of we provided comments, we provided feedback, we provided suggestions to them as to how the current status of the law affects small creators, specifically authors in our case. Uh, so that's what one of the things we are doing down in DC is working with the Copyright Office to help them amend the law in a way that reflects the way the world actually is these days. Back when they passed the DMCA was in the earlier stages. As we know, things progress, the internet has progressed, and the law needs to reflect that, especially the copyright law needs to reflect the way uh, business is done, the way copyrights are used and abused on the internet. So let me move on to another question. Um, I'm a literary attorney. Um, hi, welcome with a client who wrote a book as a joint author. The other author took the manuscript, had it published under his name only. Uh, we have abundant evidence, but she cannot afford federal or state court. Not a lot of money is at stake, but she wants credit for the work. Uh, the tribunal would be appropriate for this kind of claim, absolutely, um, because that is an infringement. I will say, however, it, with joint copyrights, um, you can also just ask for an accounting. When there are joint owners of a work under the law, um, either owner actually can, is without an agreement, uh, without an agreement in place that says anything to the contrary, either joint owner may exploit the work, license it, but they have to account to the other party for 50% of whatever they, they receive. Um, so you can also sue in state court probably for an accounting. Um, and if you are a member, um, you should uh, send in, in a request to the staff email box or go on our site where we have a link directly to fill out yeah. a, um, a request for legal assistance. Yeah, um, because we can we can walk you through that in a little more detail. Um, we had another issue like that come up actually just earlier today. Um, but joint joint works are um, very particular in that way, and everyone should just keep that in mind. When you do a joint work with somebody else, you you create a book or whatever. Um, picture books are considered joint works make sure you have a written agreement that deals yeah. with this kind of stuff mm -hmm. and you know also has attribution as yes. a requirement if either party exploits generally speaking your agreement is going to want to say that you have to agree mm -hmm. on any kind of exploitation and then talk about how how that will work and how the proceeds will be split but absolutely your client has a right uh, to an Could accounting be. and to 50 percent of any proceeds um, let me go back up. There was another question that was long. Um, okay, so last year, um, the person asked our legal department to help with the case of clear, willful, and print-on-demand plagiarism. The vendor did not apply for copyright because the vendor doesn't own copyright, and the vendor was masquerading as the author. My material was registered in 2006, published by Crown. Okay, updated the registration as the book was updated. The Authors Guild said they cannot intervene with one author against another. Okay, so that is interesting. You're saying it's an insult that AG members to call a plagiarizer an author. I would agree with that. Um, yeah, okay, I don't agree with, with that. And um, I would say if you, um, that the, the, we should not have told you that. So it, it is a policy that the Authors Guild does not represent 
one author against another, and particularly members. Now, I have asked the legal staff who, who until I came in, was very strict about that rule. I have talked to them several times about loosening up that, that restriction and not considering infringers, plagiarizers, authors. So I apologize for that. I would ask you to resubmit um, a request. And then I would also say to everybody who's a member, um, you should always, always feel free to follow up with an yes. email to staff. If you send anything to staff at authorsguild.org and you want me to see it or Cheryl, mm -hmm. just say, please, please forward, forward it this. to us. Yes. yes. Uh, John uh, Carroll, who is uh, our receptionist, mm -hmm. also my personal assistant, uh, he reads every single mm -hmm. one of these emails and knows where to forward it. And if you say, send this to Mary, he will send mm -hmm. it to Mary or to Cheryl yeah. and, and I'll see it. Um, because that is, um, yeah, that does not, the way you describe it at least, does not sound like it's another author. It sounds mm -hmm. like it's, yeah, a plagiarizer. So, I, uh, again, please, please get in touch with us. Uh, do we have more questions coming in? We have 10 minutes left. Yes. Um, and we can end early, mm -hmm. or um, we have a couple more questions. Do you want to take uh, this? Sure. Um, one specific worry is that federal judges are going to look to the small damages when they assess damages in cases before them. Uh, now here we're talking about a particular small claims tribunal in which they are, again, they're looking at cases that have a cap and damages of claims of $15,000 per claim and $30,000 per, uh, per actual total action. So yes, uh, here it's really big that you're asking for damages in an amount of, that it's, it's a smaller sort of claim. That's why you're not bringing it in the federal, in the federal court, uh, because your damages aren't above $30,000. Your damages are a smaller amount. It's perhaps a few thousand dollars that you may have lost out on a licensing fee. Uh, so it's again, the court is gonna look to what, the, what is the basis of your asking for these damages. And that's gonna be the same in any court. Uh, if it's in the small claims court, they're gonna look at what is your, what are you asking for and why. And in the federal court, they're gonna and look at what are you asking for and why. And the federal court has more discretion, certainly, in being able to give you larger measures of fees and, and, and statutory damages than the small claims court does. But here, again, we've got people who are, have expertise in the copyright arena. They know what sorts of damages are appropriate, and they're going to be familiar with uh, areas of what sorts of licenses would be appropriate. So here, actually, you've got that advantage in the small claims tribunal that you've got people who this is all they are doing is, is ruling on these particular types of actions. So that would be what's happening here. I don't think that it's going to, you're not going to, you're going to get lower damages in the small claims tribunal because that is the point of the small claims tribunal is it's for handling smaller cases, but that's not going to affect your ability or anybody's ability to get larger damages in a larger case. I, I agree with that. Um, we have small claims courts um, in, in the, yeah. at the state level mm -hmm. already, um, you know, where if your neighbor, you know, mm -hmm drives into your house, or not your house, that wouldn't be a small claim, but your bushes or <laughs> yeah. something. Mm -hmm. um, or somebody steals your lawnmower, as right. Charlie yes. likes to say. Yes. <laughs> so, um, and the um, regular state courts do not look to the damages no. given there mm -hmm. um, to no. change the way they view cases. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think that will happen. One worry, though, that has been raised by people who object to uh, who, who have had objections to the Small Claims Tribunal, the, the CASE Act. And I will say they are all, I, I, I think this is true. Every entity that's come out uh, with objections this year to the Small Claims Court, or even last year, has been um, somehow funded by Google. So I, I, I'll just <laughs> let you take from that what, what you want. Mm -hmm. But um, why would Google not want this to pass? Uh, because they really, they don't really want copyright to be enforced because people, you know, they either link to infringing content through their search um, or they, they 
you know, people view infringing content. They, they have taken a view that is very anti-copyright, that they want information to be free. They, they deem that to mean, you know, anybody should be able to post anything, even if it's infringing. And they, they have economic reasons for, for wanting that and encouraging it. So I don't take these objections too, too seriously. And I, you know, haven't gotten the feeling that people on the Hill really do either, but um, it is, um, anyway, it, it, is, it is something people talk about. Um, okay, somebody's asking about timing. And uh, when we'll be signed to the law, we are expecting both the House and the Senate to vote on it. We're hoping the House will vote on it in October. That may not happen because of, there are a lot of bills in line, apparently. Yeah. But certainly before the end of the year, there's all the momentum is there now. Um, there will be a period of time before it can be implemented. I don't remember, does it say anything in the legislation? There, there will be some. Um, there will yeah. be some, some ruling about when the bill takes effect. And, uh, it will be stated, and how far back it will go if it has any retroactive effect will be already stated in the bill as well. Yeah, and I don't think um, it is going to require that much for um, that much time uh, to get no. this up and running. It basically okay. requires three judges mm -hmm. to be hired and and. And you a know, couple and of attorneys rooms. to help. Yeah, yeah. a couple of attorneys. <laughs> um, we okay. now have construction going on outside <laughs> our window. Apologies so, for the for the ambient noise, which yes, is increasing as they, we speak. They just came down <laughs> on um, a platform. So um, we will end it here. And if you have any additional questions that we haven't gotten to, I would ask you to please email them to the staff mm -hmm. email box. And thank you, everybody, for participating today. Um, and um, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very and much. Thank, Thank you. you.